And so what are some of the major changes to your routine in the present situation and how have you adjusted? So it's kind of funny, like my routine hasn't really changed that much at all. Um, it was a little, like emotionally, it's challenging because the weight of the situation is on you. And I think there was different kind of psychological swings in it for me. Like at the beginning, there's kind of like, I don't even want to say like, uh, like, like hysteric panic, but I was almost just, just like, ah, like, here we go. We can do this, whatever. Like kind of almost, I don't want to use the word excitement because that's not it, but sort of this like energy to quickly adapt to being like, okay, like we got this. I'm going to, I'm going to be able to apply myself so much more. Maybe I can take the situation and just kind of like focus in on my work. Maybe I can use my platform to uh, be an escape for people and stuff. And I was really energized about that. And then I think the weight of the situation as it continued and how it's developed, especially in the U S it's really heavy and it really sucks. The situation is so shit for lack of a better word. So like, this is just, it's so shitty. And I wish I could like be that voice of inspiration to like turn it around or somehow thing, but there's nothing, there's nothing good about people being sick and lack of trust in the government and lack of trust amongst Americans and amongst humans internationally. It's, it's really, it's really heavy. And I feel, especially in the U S the catch 22 of people having to wage an unmeasured medical risk for themselves and others against their welfare, their human welfare of needing to survive and needing to care for the people that they love and for themselves. So I feel like people are really trapped in this impossible situation where they need to make this choice that like, I just, it's a, it's an impossible, it's an impossible situation for people. So for me, the heaviness of that and working through that has been, has been tough. Um, but showing up, even if it's just for an hour in the studio, I'm like, okay, I'm going to paint for an hour. You start small and then it grows and then you kind of get, the music's on, you can escape a little bit. So that's good. The other thing for me is that I actually work part-time at an art gallery. Um, so I worked from home for them for two months, but we actually are back in the office. So I've had my second week physically present in the gallery this week. So my routine is kind of catching back up to me. And that's giving me a glimmer of hope because routine is everything. I work in the gallery Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning, and then Wednesday afternoon through the rest of the week, I'm in the studio. So now I kind of feel like my rhythm is back, you know, like things are flowing. Um, and in fact, like my boss literally called me like, while we're on this call, and I'm like, oh God, like Gerald, what do you need? You know, uh, so I'm gonna have to call him back after this or whatever, but he's gonna come to my studio today, uh, which is kind of cool because there's a there's there's different things happening now there's different times for stuff you know uh which i guess is the only silver lining of the pandemic is maybe we have a little a different time different times to do different things and make time for for people or stuff that we didn't before necessarily that's really well put and i'm really glad that um your routine is returning to a normal or a new normal and that like it's good that you didn't just think of I guess there's a lot of like I guess there's a way to like kind of pretend it's not happening and to carry on but it's good that yeah. I really like accepted the situation as hard as it is to do and processed it emotionally and maybe creating is also an outlet that helps you with this totally and I think it is but I also am weary of this pressure that artists have to like and anyone be at the top of their game or needs to feel like the energy to do the things they normally could 
in the situation, you know, um, it's amazing if you can, it can be a huge release if you can get there. But I also think, like I said, like, this is just like a gnarly time in the world. And if people mm-hmm. just need, I've never slept more in my life. I'm <laughs> sleeping like 11 hours a night. I don't sleep like that ever. I usually sleep like seven hours. I'm sleeping literally more than I ever have in my life. And it's because the physical intensity, like the emotional intensity of the situation is, is weighing on me. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to have the restart routine and I have a couple of projects going, which is cool. Um, definitely people are thinking about their spaces and I've been getting a lot of inquiries about that. Um, I mean, I've had three commissions since the beginning of the pandemic, purely on the fact that people are stuck at home and they're like, I want to do this. I want to do that. Can you help me with this? Which has been really cool. And that has kept me going, having consistent projects and having some accountability. That's great. And helping yeah. them to kind of um, add some light into their workspace through your work. Yeah, and these commissions. exactly. And so um, speaking of your studio, then would you mind briefly showing us your workspace? And so, yeah, absolutely. And for those tuned in to the audio format, could you give a simple visual description? Yeah. Okay. So, so like I said, I'm in a warehouse in the middle of nowhere in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and my space, the whole warehouse is probably 20,000 square feet, but my space is probably 700 square feet. Um, and I have led lights and this big kind of steel open ceiling thing. Um, and then my white, my white studio walls are eight feet high which is just big enough for my canvases that take up the entire wall. Um, I'm holding my computer here, so it's a little challenging for you guys to see, but I essentially have kind of paintings everywhere and different hardware and stuff, Um, paintbrushes and, you know, painting station with all my paints, different works on progress that I'm working through. Um, I literally have this, like, you know, uh, watering pump that I've been like spraying paint on my canvases with, um, finished works that help me kind of stay in tune with the rest. So it's good for me to have things that I'm working on and things that I've already done next to each other. So that not only I feel for me personally keeps my confidence up when I'm working on like, okay, I can do this because every time you tackle a painting, it's like, how do I do this again? I mean, that's how I feel. I don't know how other artists feel, but I feel like I relearned to paint every time I tackle a new project. So Surrounding myself with work that I feel good about while I'm working on something new is really helpful for me. Great. Um, so this is the finished work here. And then here I have some works in progress. Um, I stack my, my canvases on concrete blocks. It's just the most cheap and easy way to install your work in the studio. Um, I have my music stand, my canvas roll. So when I'm building out my canvases, I just have a a huge roll of canvas that's uh 50 feet that I just roll out any size that I want um different works here uh a little Victorian couch that's from my apartment in San Francisco that I brought with me and uh my little Victorian chair from San Francisco um out here out right outside my studio I have all my uh stretcher frames that the guys who own my warehouse have built out for me so you can kind of see them all stacked up um, just ready for me to work on. Um, yeah. And then this is kind of the open space in the warehouse. You can see we have this big open space. I've installed paintings in there before just to like show clients and stuff, but my actual workspace is just this little lit up concrete room. (laughs) So yeah. Thanks so much for sharing with us. And so um, you mentioned a couple of kind of things that you do to like cultivate a space that helps you and motivates you to work. And yeah. So, and this time, can you share with us some like self care activities that you do? My sorry, I missed the last thing that you said. My what? Self-care. Oh, self care. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um. So. I like I said, I sleep a lot. Um, I don't feel guilty about sleep. Um, I really try and maximize that because if you're not rested, everything else is really hard. Um, so sleep is a top priority for me. Um, and I mean, 
these are things that are, I kind of sound kind of silly to say, but just eating right and exercising every day really helps your psychological and physical strength in everything that you do. Um, so, you know, I'm really big into cooking. I think the rituals of cooking are therapeutic, not only for your body, but for your mind. And are all, that's also a creative outlet for me. You know, <laughs> every time you design a plate, there's composition there and there's color there. And you can create these little moments of pleasure for yourself that make every day a little easier and a little bit more fun. Um, so I think cooking is a big self-care component for me, definitely. And, and I really push myself to exercise every day. I think the endorphins are hugely important and not just artists, but anyone, just even if it's just walking 30 minutes a day, um, just helps clear your mind and helps you work through some things and release some energy. So those are my, those are my big things. Um, eating right, sleeping, and, and some exercise. Um, I've also learned over time just not to, not to need everything to happen right away. I think when I was coming out of school, I was used to juggling a lot of different projects and I was expecting myself to have an output that maybe just wasn't realistic. Um, and I think just giving myself the time to work through stuff at my own pace and not feeling like, I don't know, that that I'm, I'm not a painter unless I make this many things or that I'm not a, I'm not at the, you know, like none of that's true. All of that is just kind of, imposter syndrome and it's just feeding into your anxiety and your insecurities which I mean I have I'm sure a lot of people have so really trying to avoid that inner voice that's telling me that I'm not I don't know what I'm doing or that like that I suck or whatever like trying to not give in to those feelings uh to that fear it's great to hear that you've developed (laughs) yeah more trust in the process and I think that's like what yeah. a lot of artists are dealing with too, just on the everyday basis, because it's really just the like final work that the public sees, but yeah. there's so much more that goes on in the process behind it that they don't see. And yeah. so speaking of that, what's a key element of your process that's not evident in your end work, but that's really important to you? Um. I mean, it's, it's not very, um, it's not very dramatic, but I, I just stare at my work in progress for a long time and I take pictures of it and I look at it through different ways. I take it outside. I put it on the ground. I put it, you know, I try and move the work around in different places and I try and see it in different ways because sometimes if you are always looking from the same perspective, you you miss the one spot that was working. So you need, I think as an artist, you're always trying to change the ways that you're looking and just seeing things from from literally different perspectives. So slowing that process down, maybe painting quickly, but then slowing down, okay, taking a step back, really appreciating that that time that you spent on it. Okay, like I'm going to look at this in some different spaces. I'm going to try and get my mind to see this in a couple of different ways before I jump into the next layer, before I jump into the next phase of the work. Um, so yeah, I think living with your works in progress is is probably the, the the part of my process that people don't know. You know, it doesn't it doesn't happen at one sitting. It happens over, you know, three to six weeks and and in weird bursts and then really slow. And then bursts and then really slow. You know? And yeah, you gotta be patient with yourself. So do you usually do like yeah. uh, a few projects at the same time then? Or like, I guess, a few paintings at the same time? Yeah, I probably do probably five paintings at once. Um, it just helps that temptation from overworking something. Um, it helps me deal with the temptation to use paint just because it's there. Um, I think painters can get into that sometimes. Maybe you mix with like a bunch of this amazing color and you're just like, Oh, I don't want to waste this color. So I'm just going to like cover the whole canvas with it. And it's like, don't do that. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so it forces me to be a little bit more thoughtful about each work, but also unify them. Um, which is really great. I think for building out a series when things aren't just like, you know, one painting at a time and moving through. No, like when a body of work can rise up together, 
you end up learning something new from every single piece and then bringing that element to the other one. Um, so I think working on a bunch of things is really useful. It helps slow down. It helps you not get too frustrated or, um, or too bogged down. It also helps you replicate what you've learned the next time because you're just like repeating the same lessons and you're trying to replicate your marks, but you never can. And so you're kind of training yourself to be like, how do I recreate these mini performances and what can I control and what can't I control for the next one? So yeah, it's a, it's a choreography of rituals, you know? Because I guess from Queens until now, um, were there any periods that you like stopped creating for any particular reasons or just experienced yeah. difficult circumstances that held you back from creating? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, for sure. Uh, between Australia and grad school, like I said, I was just like focusing on work. Like I was living in Toronto for the sole purpose of working at bars that would make me the most tips and saving up as much money to buy myself the most epic materials. So like moved to San Francisco, like the goal was not to like, figure out how to be an artist and whatever in Toronto. The goal when I was there was literally, I was working like, I had three jobs. I was working like 70 hours a week and I had like eight hours off on Sunday from when I like, you know, finished at three o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning. And then I'd be working that same Sunday night, closing the bar again. So like, I just like that period of time, I think it's, it's really important for anyone to know, like, what's the priority and just make that the priority because you can always add on other goals you can always say, oh, I wish I could do that. I wish I could incorporate this or juggle this or whatever. That's fine. That's fine. But what's your priority? Because you need to understand that you only have so much energy in a day and you only have so much capacity. So if the priority is saving money to go to San Francisco, make that the priority. <laughs> like, um, so that was a challenge. And then similarly, when I graduated, I needed to figure out how to stay in the US. I needed to get a work visa, um, the state here. So there was definitely a period of time when I moved to Charlotte that I was juggling, figuring out how to get my immigration in order before I could jump into really flushing out my practice. Um, and like I said, I was really hard on myself during that time and I regret it because I was doing the best that I could and, uh, and it worked out. I just needed some time you know? So, so yeah, when I first moved to Charlotte, I was working full-time 40 hours a week uh, at the McCall center, which is a residency uh, art program in Charlotte. Um, and trying to get in a car after working in nine to five and driving out to a warehouse and painting by yourself in a city where you don't know anyone was really hard. <laughs> I love painting, but it was really, really hard. How did you balance um, all of that and add structure? Like it really depends yeah. on you to implement that. Yeah, yeah, and you're exhausted. So that I did for a while, but transitioning into part-time work and then having more of my like regular hours in the studio was a game changer for me. Um, and it shows in my work. I mean, what I created from when I was working part-time until now has been some of my best work. And what I was working on before that was still good, but it just wasn't as prolific. I just didn't have the energy to like push through enough paintings. <laughs> like, and that's okay. You don't have to work all the time. I think people who are really, really engaged with their artwork are thinking about it all the time, no matter where they are. So, and that's okay. You can still claim that you're working, even if you don't have a brush in your hand, you know, you're thinking about work. <laughs> Maybe you're sketching in your phone. Maybe you're collecting reference images. Maybe you're having conversations with other artists or you're looking at other people working through some stuff online. You're still working. 100%. And for those times that you had like a part-time job, but nine to five, that's much more than a part-time job. So like, and then you would go to yeah. the studio after. How did you juggle that? It was really challenging. I was just physically tired but yeah I would drive 20 minutes to my warehouse after work and just try and push through it as long as I could um but it was very tough 
And I think it was also really tough because I was in a new city where I didn't have, you know, I wasn't in a warehouse with all my friends like I had been in the past. You know, in San Francisco, I was in a warehouse with like all my best friends and we'd all be working together and we'd all get dinner together. We'd take a break, we'd go back in, we'd paint some more. Um, I was out here alone and I didn't even really understand what like, when you first graduate, I feel like you're kind of confused as to how you're going to connect point A to point B. Maybe you have a goal. You're like, okay, I really want to like make a connection with a local gallery or maybe not even, you know, like any gallery, um, an online gallery, like what, like whatever. I'm just using that as an example, but you have some goal that you're working towards, but you haven't exactly figured out how you're going to connect where you are to that goal. And I was kind of facing that without my peers and without my community. So I was like, wow, okay, I'm going to like create these paintings. And what am I going to do with them? (laughs) You know? So, I mean, thank God for the internet. I think that got me through it so much because I really leveraged my Instagram to just share with people what I was going through. And I didn't feel as lonely because I could still... I could still see what people were making in California. I could see what people were making in Canada and I could share what I was making. And I was getting that positive reinforcement from people online. And that was, that was huge. <laughs> you know, um, I felt like I was getting a lot of support from my friends and family and my, and my artist peers online. So that was, that was huge, but it was a struggle. <laughs> and it must've been difficult putting your work out there for the first time too. Yes and no. I mean, I've just been really, I've been doing, I've been putting my work online since undergrad and I'm kind of used to the vulnerability in that. I think that's something as an artist that the more vulnerable you are, the more you're going to get out of it because it's, there's a lot of anxiety and thinking about how people may respond differently to you, but those people who are going to like not like you or be like, Oh God, she's crazy. Or, or, Oh my God, this is so embarrassing. Look at what she's doing. Fuck those people. You know what I mean? Like you don't need those people in your life. And so yeah, it's, you know, so, so yeah, there's this risk that you're going to put yourself out there and you're going to face a bunch of rejection, but like from people that you don't need. So the people that are left, then you have a more honest connection with and you, and they're they're real to you and they they know you and that's so and that's so cool so for me yeah it's challenging there's a little bit of nerves in it you know like oh what if what if my painting sucks but like what if your painting sucks who cares you know make another one and i think that's a big thing that i figured out is not every single one of my works has to be my best work you actually need to work through some bad, bad quote unquote bad painting to figure out what the heck is a good painting because no one knows what a good painting is you just know how you feel when you're in front of work that you're attracted to so you need to work through like you need to work through challenging creative moments to really come to those special moments where you're like this is on point i'm vibing with this right now you have to you have to feel both (laughs) a hundred percent you said it so well and like thank you for your honesty too Thanks so much for tuning in. We would love to hear your thoughts or questions. Please let us know in the comments and review section, and we'll try to cover it in the next sessions. If you enjoy this content, please share and subscribe for more episodes. For latest updates, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Art Focus Exchanges.